language is Arabic, but uh, I will pray in English and Arabic. Uh, I hope if I did uh, any mistake in English, so I apologize from now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, I give thanks to the chance that given to me today to speak in uh, this great church. Let's pray. Father God, we lift up our missionaries overseas, Lord. You have called them away from their home and to follow, to follow you for your purpose in their lives and to the lives of, the, of those they come into contact with, uh, just as Hebrew 11 verse 8 reminds us of Abraham going by obedience not knowing what he would find in the journey ahead. Overseas missionaries, much like Abraham, have awoken to the, to the call in their own hearts to venture beyond uh, what they have known of, uh, to follow in obedience, to share with others about you, Lord. Father, we pray protect, protection over them. We pray for safety as they take every step in obedience into these lands. We pray that the hearts they come into contact with the, would be open and willing to hear and receive the beautiful and life-altering alter, the truth of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray for open doors and victory in your, in your name so that more of your children would come to the table of the Lord. Uh, may doors that have been long since closed to visitors swing wide open by, di by divine uh, influence in order that your call to all of your followers may be carried out by your holy plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I pray in Arabic. I hope someone can understand me. Shukran lak ya Rabbi Yesu li ajil hadhi al-fursa li a'tayta ilna ya Rabb. Ashkurak ya ilahi al-hay li annak hayyat ya Rabb. خدام وتلاميذ يا رب مثل ما كان عندك في في وقتك يا رب تلاميذك إنك هيأت الآن يا رب أيضا ناس لكي تنقل كلمة الخلاص يا رب نشكرك يا رب لأنك لم تترك أولادك يا رب في هذا العالم بدون أن توصل لهم الكلمة يا رب وتنقذهم يا رب من نار جهنم يا رب نشكرك لأجل التلاميذ المهيئين لأجل نشر كلمتك في العالم لأن العالم كله محتاج يا رب إلى خلاص نشكرك يا رب يا رب نترك هؤلاء الخدام يا رب والتلاميذ بين يديك لكي يا رب تحفظهم في الطريق 
وتحفظ عوائلهم يا رب وتبارك كلامهم يا رب تقودهم بالروح القدس وتكمل معهم يا رب تأتي بأولاد كثيرين إلى مائدتك يا رب نشكرك يا رب لأجل خططك وتدابيرك العظيمة يا رب يا رب نعطيك المجد والكرامة يا رب يا رب تحفظهم يا ربي وترجعهم إلى أماكنهم السالمين باسم يسوع المسيح نطلب لك المجد والإكرام إلى الأبد آمين Good morning, NBC family. Okay, that was a good start. I think Ricky got us sorted on this earlier. Let's try it again. Good morning, NBC family. Ah, oh, yeah, that's better. It's good to be amongst family. Today, as we continue to look at our self-denial series, we want to take some time and look into the Great Commission. In many ways, this passage is found at the end of Matthew 28, is completely Jesus-focused. The Great Commission that we read about is Jesus' discussion with his disciples and with us, his church. The Great Commission is his invitation to us to join him as he builds his kingdom. It is based on Jesus' authority. It continues Jesus' mission and it declares Jesus' presence. It is rooted in the commanding character of Jesus, his commanding authority, his commanding mission, and his commanding presence. Well, let's take a moment and back up a few verses and look at this verse in context. The Great Commission to Ordinary People. Now, Matthew 28, 16 tells us that the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Hmm. Eleven. The number eleven limps. It's not the perfect number twelve. Author and theologian Frederick Bruner says, the church that Jesus sends into the world is elevenish, imperfect, and it's fallible. Yet Jesus uses this imperfect church to do his perfect work. Well, let's be honest. Um, the church is a bit 11-ish. And when we look deeper, we realize we personally are too. But Jesus takes this imperfect group of disciples and gives them a perfect job to do. Notice they are simply called disciples. They're not leaders or priests, or any other title. Just disciples. Someone who is continually learning from him. That's all we should ever want to be. Jesus' disciples. Because to Jesus, that is the only title and job description that matters. Jesus met each man and simply said, come follow me. His disciples obeyed. Earlier in Matthew 28.10, Jesus told the women at the tomb to tell the disciples to go to Galilee and there you will see me. The disciples listened and they went to Galilee. 
because they heard Jesus might be alive and they wanted to find out. Going to Galilee was going back to their beginnings, going home to that little place where Jesus had first met and called them. His disciples worshipped. Later in verse 17, we read, When they saw him, they worshipped him. They were overwhelmed to see Jesus again and to recognize him as the risen Lord. So they worshipped him. To worship him means they saw Jesus to really be God. His disciples doubted. However, in that very same verse, we read, but some doubted. Some doubted? Scripture does not indicate who or how many. But how can that be? How can people worship someone that they doubt? How could they doubt while seeing the risen Christ before them? <clears throat> I love the honest way Scripture is written. If I was writing this scene, I would miss out the doubt part. Or at least try and kind of gloss over it. But Scripture records the frailty and humanity of the disciples, which is very telling and reassuring. Because I can doubt too. It's not difficult to worship him one moment and then hold doubts the next. Even during the most powerful worship experience or in the face of the most amazing miracle, I can still carry elements of doubt. This is something we can all do. These disciples, too, live their lives between worship and doubt. Christians are both believers and doubters, adoring and wondering, trusting and questioning. Now, isn't it great that Matthew admits this? I think we all experience living between these two extremes, and it's not healthy to deny it. The good news is that Jesus uses exactly such worshiping and doubting disciples. See, Jesus responds to their doubt. Jesus does not correct them or cast out a demon of doubt but he deliberately overlooks it and gives the Great Commission instead. Jesus reminds them of who he is. He does have all authority. Jesus is teaching them that they will win their war with doubt by simply obeying his mission command. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. As Frederick Bruner says, there has never been a worshiper of Jesus who did not doubt him. Matthew daringly included this divided mind at the very birth of this mission, saying doubt should not be taken so tragically. Jesus' response is to call them forward and send them out, knowing that obedience to the will of God is the way to the knowledge of God. As Albert Schweitzer once said, follow him and you will know him. God's love language is obedience. Those original disciples were uniquely created and gifted. 
here at NBC, we have recently participated in a study about some of the personalities and idiosyncrasies of the original disciples in the scriptures. But the same is true for us. Each one of us is also uniquely and specially hand-carved to play a role in the mission of God. Jesus didn't call, just call some of his disciples. He called them all for different purposes. They each had a different part to play and a path to take. The Great Commission is so large that it encompasses all of us and so personal that Jesus has a unique part for each of us to play. Through obedience, we come to know Jesus more deeply, and our little faith is multiplied on the road, grown in and for the kingdom. What am I being called to do? Last Sunday, if you were here, <clears throat> we highlighted the importance of going. Moving in one direction, everyone matters, unengaged, unreached people groups, the request for more workers, Bibles to all, believers yet to hear the good news, body of Christ, making disciples, breakthrough prayer. Half the people in New Zealand do not follow any given religion. Jesus' great commission is a command to be on the move. Whether we cross the room, or the road, or the world, we are called to be on the go, moving towards people. Jesus told his disciples to make disciples, not converts. And as we go about our lives, we are asked to make disciples too. We must always remember, Jesus does the converting. He asks us to walk through life working with his children as we follow his teachings. While the first word of Jesus' command is go, or to move out, the outcome is to make disciples the call to go modifies the command to make disciples. We could reword this to say, as you are going, make disciples. Disciples are learners, followers, and apprentices. Jesus is calling disciples to make disciples. To share what you know as a disciple and to model how you live as a disciple. Being a disciple is often more caught than taught. Jesus gave his disciples and us a clue to this when he told his disciples that he would make them fishers of men. Make Jesus following disciples. We're not called to make Buddhists better Buddhists or to give secular people better values or to fill, fill people's heads with theology. Jesus' great commission calls us, without apology, to connect people with Jesus, which is the innermost meaning of the meaning of the word disciple. Jesus calls us all to be involved. God has crafted each one of us uniquely. There is no one else like you or me. We each have a unique set of skills, abilities, experiences, and passions. God has made each one of us to enjoy a unique relationship with him and to make our unique contribution in God's kingdom. You have been carefully hand-carved, and you are needed. The great omission? Many of us 
Well, we've often heard teaching and preaching on this topic of the Great Commission. As it says in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. But have you heard of the great omission? You see, being a dis his disciple is not for someone else to do. Being his disciple is something for us to be. We should not omit ourselves from Jesus' command to go and to preach and to make disciples. To make disciples, you should be a disciple. Now, I am by no means a perfect example of a disciple. Jesus is still working on that. My father led me to Jesus when I was only 11 years old. Jesus led our entire family to Pakistan not soon after that. He used my parents' skills to work in a hospital while he continued to hand carve me as only he can. He used my parents and my teachers at that time to disciple me along the way. He continued to disciple me in university through godly teachers. He gave me many opportunities to serve him in church, being discipled by my pastors and my parents. Discipleship is a, un is a unique a process as each hand-carved disciple. Now, our own family gatherings here at NBC have many opportunities to grow and to serve. Our own family here has plenty of its, its disciples serving in the local community and overseas. Ehrotahi has many opportunities for his disciples to go and make other disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus instructed his disciples to start locally, in Jerusalem, right where they were. As we follow Jesus, as we follow his leading in our lives, he will expand our world so that as we are going, we can continue to be his disciple and disciple others. As Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Maybe God is giving you a nudge to go with your doubts, but ready to serve. Do you have skills in education, medicine, administration, finance, discipleship, youth, IT, business? God wants you. Doubts and flaws are allowed. God is asking for courage and faith. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you as your disciple. We stand here as a group, a family. We are your church. You have called us. You have equipped us. You are calling us. Lord, help us to see clearly where you want us to be going. Give us the strength, the wisdom, the knowledge that we need to make disciples for you and not ourselves. Help us to hear your words and to tell others your words. Help us to remember that we are unique, hand-carved disciples that you have created, called, and empowered. Help us to remember 
that it is not us in our strength, but it is you in your strength that enables us to do that. Amen.